Mini episode 1221 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1221. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here. This is part seven of our ongoing Coronavirus Crisis 2020 series. And uh, as we'd indicated at the outset of it, we're going to be looking at all different aspects of life right now in quarantine. And part of that is streaming recommendations. So our part seven today, we are going through the world of pro graps here, the sport of kings, if you will. Breaking it down, recommendations, things for all of you to watch out there on your streaming services. And I think most of these recommendations you could probably get from WWE Network. It is the largest, most comprehensive one out there with the tape libraries they have of themselves. WCW, ECW, and a handful of other promotions. And uh, this is a segment where if you were listening to our WrestleMania 36 recap a few weeks back, during that segment, uh, it, it was not necessary for me to do so. I could have done this anyways. But uh, I put FDH Lounge dignitary Jake Digman, our MMA editor, and uh, I put him on the spot and I said, hey, you got to come on and you got to be part of this uh, streaming recommendations deal. So again, uh, nobody is better suited to come on and do this than our good friend Jake Digman. Jake, welcome back to the show, my friend. Life in quarantine, talking pro graphs. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what is this, quarantine day? I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> what day of the week is it? One of the local TV stations is uh, doing a feature on that. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're all doing a feature on that now. <laughs> it's like, I don't remember what day it is. Make sure you, I saw something that was like, make sure you plan like a routine so that you know what each day is. On Monday, you know, you have this for dinner. On Tuesday, you have this. I'm like, man, this is like my paradise. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying, again, knock on wood, but uh, things throughout this have not been markedly different for me as far as doing work from home and that kind of stuff throughout. But I know it's been different for a lot of people, and obviously none of us are getting out recreationally, socially, because all the places we would go to are closed. So it uh, you could have known at the outset of this thing, and this was part of the planning that went into this several weeks ago on our part, obviously streaming is going to be a huge cornerstone of anybody's attempts to get through these trying times here. And, of course, uh, there's plenty of wrestling stuff out there, but streaming overall, we're going to do a separate segment on TV recommendations as far as different TV shows. But uh, for stuff for, for the for the pro graphs, again, it is the golden age of being a fan, Jake Digman, because there's just so much you can go back and rewatch over a period of time or watch for the first time, as the case may be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like if somebody would have told them, you know, 12 year old Jake, that, you know, they would have access to all of the pro wrestling in history at, at fingertips, and he'd be like, eh, there's still nothing on. Well. <laughs> 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 it's, just, it's just unfortunately the crazy world we live in, the legal the options they have right now. And obviously, the first and foremost, you have the uh, WWE Network, which is the most popular one for most people. But there's also, you know, there's the, uh, what do I think, Impact has their own streaming service. Yep. Then there's, um, and I think it's launched an AG Wrestling channel. I forget the name of it. Like, I might be just called AG Wrestling Channel. <laughs> that has a bunch of free stuff on there. And then uh, there's, you know, the old trusted YouTube that has quite a bit of stuff if you know where to look. Yeah, YouTube's got it. And even on my Roku, and at first I was excited when I heard about this, that somebody launched the channel that was like old, early 80s Southwest Championship Wrestling. And from having watched a decent chunk of it back in the day when it was on the USA Network as a kid, I was kind of psyched. And I'm watching this pre-USA Network stuff, I'm like, ugh, this doesn't hold up. There's nobody here that I've ever even heard of, hardly. It seems to be all jobber matches, like, of, of all the things to put out there. Uh, yeah, so 
there is definitely a range, good to bad, of things that are available. And again, you get what you pay for. It didn't cost me anything to watch that on my Roku. But the WWE Network, which is going to predominate what we're talking about here today, this is one of these things where, at least in my case, it's the back library. It's the fact that you can watch anything you want to from any point in time in history, uh, from the WCW and ECW pay-per-views, their pay-per-views, their old TV shows. If it wasn't for that, Jake, I would have quit the network a long time ago. I'm not one of these people that's like, oh, I can watch the monthly pay-per-view. Instead of like, I wouldn't have been ordering those pay-per-views anyways. What do I care? I'm there for the tape library, basically. Oh, yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, it's one of those, like, the monthly pay-per-views, I, I watch them because I pay for them and right. I have it. Uh -huh. But it's not my, like, go-to, like, motivation thing for having the network. Actually, it's funny, last night I was uh, watching them. Uh, I started watching the I watched like three or four episodes of WCW Saturday Night from 1993 that I'd never seen. That is like, I just started at the beginning. Dude, that is hilarious because one of the things that I've been doing to just sort of keep myself sane in quarantine is I, I, I'm going back and doing a little bit of fantasy rebooking from time to time. And I was thinking about WCW in early 92, about the time Watts took over. Uh, and I used as a line of demarcation Super Brawl. Two, so I watched that one there. So you and I are watching stuff right about the same time period. It's hilarious. Although ninety-two to ninety-three was a time of tremendous change on the roster, no question. Oh yeah, well, was. And then it was it's funny because they had the whole Arn Anderson jumping Eric Watts out the parking lot of the gas station, uh -huh. and then the cops got called, and I was just like, that's that like, no wonder everybody hated Eric Watts. Right. <laughs> Something was supposed to get him. Over as a sympathetic baby face, it did not work. Yeah, and the kid, even the little girl was cheering for Arn, which was funny. Yeah. Like, hey, look, that's Arn Anderson. I want his other. <laughs> Everybody deep down was a smart wrestling fan that knew that Arn Anderson is an all-time great, and Eric Watts was basically uh, ten pounds in a five-pound bag, so to speak, of uh, excrement as far as his abilities in the ring or lack thereof. But uh, oh, yeah. You mean a promoter or booker is going to push their son all the way above their knees? <laughs> <laughs> never happened. Yeah. Never happened. Never. Sincerely, Fritz von Erich, Vern Gagne, et cetera, et cetera. Jeff, Jeff Jarrett, Triple H. Do you know what more a challenge? To find a promotion where that didn't happen. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That would be. That would I, be. I, I got to be honest. I can't wait for 37 time uh, NXT Women's Champion Aurora Rose. <laughs> well, if they're even still around or under the same ownership, if you believe the recent rumors here. So, you know, there's there's all yeah, that to get to. <laughs> we, could, we, we could soon, well, if, you know, if comes back up again, we could be riding the uh, WWE ride at Disney one day. <laughs> Very possibly, yeah. And there are, uh, there are a number of uh, multi-generational wrestlers that we're going to talk about here in the course of what we are... Uh, going through, and uh, there are some names that will come up more than others. Uh, so for this survey, this is something that, well, this is not an FDH Lounge Pantheon project. It is Pantheon adjacent, as we say, similar type things as far as crowdsourcing this to the FDH Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, so during this narrow window during the quarantine, I got a handful of replies back. So in addition to myself and Jake, it is Russ Cohen, the proprietor of Sportsology, and, uh, and all these folks, FDH Lounge dignitaries as well, Ron Glasnap, John Adams, Chris Galloway. Uh, the three categories that we're going through are, uh, and it's top three in each category as far as making recommendations. The, the matches of these pro wrestlers, the pro wrestling cards to watch, and the matches to watch. Top three in each of these here. Uh, it is funny. I'm going to start with Chris Galloway because I can get him out of the way because all three categories are summed up this way. Uh, Chris returned the survey, and again, he filled out the TV portion of this, which will be a subsequent recording. But for the wrestling ones, for each of those, he read, no. Re or he put down, no recommendations, read a book. So I, Jake, you're going to love this because... He, you and I are very good at trolling people, Jake. So what I did is I took a picture of a book, and I sent it back to him. I texted him a picture of a book, and I said, Well, when you're right, you're right. I am enjoying this book, and it is awesome. The book is Death of the Territories, Expansion, Betrayal, and the War that Changed Pro Wrestling Forever. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. 
that, that's what I was asking. I'm like, what did you do? Did you set up the death of a territory, or uh, or was it blood, blood red and being stuff? Uh, <laughs> green or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know each other so well. You knew where I was going with that one, basically. <laughs> I actually, there's actually a book on Amazon I want to get, uh, Nitro by Guy Evans. Uh -huh. The whole story where he actually, he actually interviews all of the, um, like, Turner Broadcast employees and various other people who've never spoken out about the death of WCW. And I'm like, that just sounds like, you know, something that's, I'm a nerd, and that, that, that intrigues me. Wow. I can just imagine it. Chapter 12, the Bob Dew sessions. <laughs> See? That'd be great. Yeah. That's not entertainment. I don't know exactly what went wrong with Bill Bush. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the, the parts on Sharon Sidello might be very interesting if they're candid on her part, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> hashtag Oli. But, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to knock off one of these other dignitaries in one fell swoop here as well. Actually, two of these because there are uh, two folks here that uh, we, we can eliminate here with this category. Russ Cohen only gave uh, uh, recommendations in this category for the wrestler, uh, that, wrestlers that he would re uh, recommend their matches. Uh, Seth Rollins, Aleister Black, and Asuka. For cards and matches, he put down nothing lately. So I think Russ thought this was an entirely contemporary survey, which it wasn't, but that's okay. I suppose my wording was imprecise. I don't think those would be the guys from all time that he would recommend if that were the case. But uh, particularly in the case of Aleister Black, it's relatively thin if you're just going off of his WWE tenure. If you've got WWN or one of these other streaming services and you can check out his work as Tommy End, then uh, that might be... Uh, something that would really add to it. His debut, I think, as Tommy End at the WWE UK tournament in 2017, he had a pretty good match, I think, with Neville uh, on there, if I remember correctly, and uh, it, prior to taking on his present persona. But Rollins, uh, Black, and Asuka is probably not a combination you expected to hear today, Jake Digman. Uh, no, not. And it's funny, like, you, when you mentioned Tommy, uh, you mentioned uh, Alistair Black as Tommy End. My first time seeing him was with you. And everybody at the NXT show was all excited. I'm like, who's that guy? Oh. Like, it's Tommy Ann. Who's Tommy Ann? <laughs> oh, that's right. I remember that. That was uh, in in Warren at the uh, at the yeah. Young, Youngstown show, and they were. I remember. I don't remember if it was Caleb Braxton that was the ring announcer or whatever, but I remember putting this to the text. Uh, the test here, as it were, that on the on the they had a video screen where they were showing different tweets that were coming up with uh, hashtag WWE Youngstown. So I was just testing it to see if they had anybody screening them, and it was something like this ring announcer has a great ass hashtag WWE Youngstown. Yes, there was somebody <laughs> on quality control, Jake, because it never showed up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you know. <laughs> Let's leave it to Rick Morris to cause a stir. Again. That's right. That's right. The other thing, too, one of the other things I, rec I remember from that night, ironically, another one of the wrestlers on his list, Asuka. If you remember this part, when uh, I think she threw her opponent out of the ring, and then they were doing the uh, Asuka's going to kill you chant. Do you remember when she got up on the turnbuckle, the middle turnbuckle, and she started directing the crowd section by section on the chant? That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was. What a great night. And, uh, yeah, so all three of them. I, 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 I find that, um, who is this again? Whose list is this? Uh, Russ Cohen, Cohen from Sportsology. Oh, Russ, Russ Cohen, I'm sorry. Yes. So, I find it interesting that Russ Cohen's list is, is he has three people that are currently on the roster right now, and his cards are nothing recently. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And that, so he, he must have interpreted this as just meaning contemporary wrestlers because Russ is, uh, he's a gentleman who's a couple of years older even than me. He's an old Northeastern WWF guy, so this list would look a lot different, I think, if he understood it to be from all time. It would probably be predominated by uh, wrestlers in there. Might even be some Bruno on his list here, which I got to tell you, by the way, going back and looking at the network, and this is not to speak ill of the dead, but I mean, I was watching old WWF shows from the Garden. Oh my God, those do not hold up. As far as work rate or anything like that, I mean... People were conditioned to get excited for stuff today where we would just be yawning and falling asleep. Props to them for you know, successfully entertaining the crowd with that, but that is not a style that aged well, I'm afraid. 
I mean, yeah, but also, I mean, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, back then, they were trying to simulate a fight. Now they're just doing a choreographed performance. That's true. That's true. That's, and it, that's good. I mean, and that's kind of the issue that I have. Uh, or or uh, the, the king of old school, the old uh, corny, I like to say. It's like, you know, there, there isn't a lot of, like, everything's too polished. Like, you people sit there criticizing, like, oh my God, they mocked that move. I want people to, the most old people hurt. If it doesn't, if there isn't a mistake, it seems like, you know, that it, to me, it just comes across, it's like, it's just way too, you're working together way too much, and it takes me out of it's like, I don't know if I heard, like, the Young Bucks mentioned it. They were just like, you know, you could blatantly tell. So, like, everybody, like, uh, even going back to, like, the WWE, I'm sure a name that's going to be on here, uh, that's on here a lot, or I would assume as much as WrestleMania X7, which many people consider to be one of the greatest cars of all time. The four times over time that I've seen the, uh, the TLC, it's just a blatant spot for this, where one's going, the next thing, into the next thing, into the next thing. And when you see it, it's like, now when I watch any ladder match, that's all I see. I just see guys, but you can set up next thing. It's like, you know, I don't know. It just, like, it takes me out of it. But, well, you know, it's just a cool, an old fan now. I don't know. That's hilarious looking ahead here because what you just said is going to come up not once but twice in the subsequent list as we go along here. So, on, much. yeah, yeah, on, uh, on wrestlers, the other guy that we are wiping off the list right now is Johnny Adams because this is the only category he voted in. Uh, again, appreciate the votes from everybody uh, that was a part of this thing. The three wrestlers that he would recommend, Roddy Piper, Ric Flair, and the Road Warriors, now, Johnny is somebody, he's an old school fan, and he's somebody who, again, I, I don't think he was even a fan during the glory days of the late 90s and everything like that. So, for Johnny, and he'll be the first to tell you this, it's all about the spectacle, uh, by and large. And if you're looking for spectacle, you can't do any better than Piper Flair and the Warriors. Oh, absolutely. Th those guys are uh, just first ballot Hall of Famers as far as how that goes. Uh, Ron Glasnap, his three selections... And this is where you start to get a little bit closer uh, to me and you as far as work rate and things like that. Uh, this I don't know if you consider this a holy trinity of work rate, but uh, there might be some. Ric Flair, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, and Shawn Michaels. Almost kind of a waste putting down Flair and Steamboat because you could have put either one of them down on the list and gotten the matches with the other one. But then each one had their own matches here. You've, each of them having a, a big series of matches with uh, Randy Savage, by the way. You get all the matches that Michaels had with Hart and all the other ones. By the way, uh, token unpopular opinion that I'm about to put out there. This is something Kyle Ross never agreed with on, on the, the show with me. Steamboat Savage, WrestleMania three. I didn't feel like it held up. It was like, oh, so you've got a million two counts. Oh, so it was good work rate when nobody else was doing good work rate. Oh, yeah, so... I know that's not a popular opinion. Feel free to denounce me for that. No, I actually somewhat agree with you on that. I remember the first time I saw that match, and I went, oh, that was the match that everybody talked about as being the match. But then again, I saw it after the fact. I'm sure if you watched it live as it was happening, right. it was probably my book. Right. But I remember watching it after the fact, and just being like, it was good, but it wasn't like, you know, this end all three. It was one of those things that you, you call it great because you're told it's great. That was always my perspective on it. It was like, I came into it and that, you know, uh, Kyle would always say to me, well, you know, on a matter of expectations or whatever. I'm like, but that's how I am. I have a bar of expectations. And I heard it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it was like a really good match. But yeah, I didn't feel like it held up. But obviously, uh, Flair, Steamboat, Michaels, uh, you can't do much better than those three. The direction that I went in, I exploited not exactly a loophole, but I did say in the balloting here, that you get uh, either half, if you take either half of a tag team, you get all of their matches as a single, as a tag team, if they tag with other partners. I'm going to drop that as a hint, Jake Digman. I'm going to come to that one in a second here. Think of a great tag team wrestler with multiple partners and see if you can guess the third one on my list. First one on my list was Ric Flair because I, that, that seems obligatory. Uh, nobody had more great matches with more big stars than him, plus other matches with guys that weren't even necessarily the biggest stars, but things that you'd still want to see. Going to the modern era, the WWE Network only does justice to maybe about half of this guy's catalog at best, but I'm saying Daniel Bryan because he is my favorite of the modern wrestlers, so you're getting everything that he's done in the WWE in the 2010s, 
now slash 2020. So you're getting that part of his career at least. And then uh, again, epic tag team wrestler, multiple tag team partners slash multiple great tag teams. Can you guess who my third guy was, Jake? No. <laughs> okay. I really can't. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, not the pitch was a name that popped into my head. Uh, he had multiple runs, and he got all those different people on that one. But it doesn't seem like the kind of guy you would pick, so. No. Uh, and my other two thoughts were Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton. You did get it. It was Bobby Eaton, past lounge guest. And, uh, yes, Bobby Eaton it was, was my third one because you get both incarnations of the Midnight Express. You get him and Arn uh, together in that great Dangerous Alliance tag team. Uh, you, you get all hell. You get the uh, if you want it the blue bloods matches with Regal yeah. in '94. <laughs> that's that's the overlooked great period of Bobby Eaton's career, and uh, the Earl of Eating. <laughs> yeah, the Earl of Eating. <laughs> okay. okay, speaking of the blue bloods, yes. Where Lord Stephen Regal is trying to teach beautiful Bobby Eaton how to be like classy and to be the queen are fantastic and still hold up to this day. Yes. <laughs> do you remember those? I do. And I don't remember the context, but I remember William Regal with a very snobby look on his face, then Steve, Stephen Regal, Lord Stephen Regal. I remember with a very snobby look on his face, speaking of hot dogs. <laughs> that was just <laughs> the greatest. Nobody could, nobody could do a character like that better than Regal. Nobody. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for the most part, basically. So those are. It's like, it's like when I when I found out that Regal's real name was a guy named Bear, he collected reptiles. I was like, Nah, I don't want to believe that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing too, and that you you factor in the whole carnival wrestling thing, brass knucks. Like, he's gone with that persona at different points, but that is so far removed from that. You know, the guy on the carny scene in his teens and everything like that. I prefer to think of him as a blue blood. I, I enjoy kayfabe better in this case. But, uh, so those were my three. Your three, you had one of the uh, same three. The second one you had listed was Ric Flair. Uh, the third one you had listed was Raven. The first one you had listed, this comes as no shock to me, Brock Lesnar. So, you, you, are, you are running the gamut there, my friend, because uh, in terms of in terms of classic work rate, Flair comes the closest. In terms of character work, you've got Raven. Hell, for that matter, you got Scotty Flamingo and Johnny Polo if you want it. You, yeah, I do. You got <laughs> you got Brock Lesnar for the for the big fight uh, scenarios that he's had through the course of his career. So, thoughts on how you landed on those three? Um, okay, well, Brock Lesnar is to me is the most believable character in wrestling history. No matter when Brock comes out, you believe he's going to win. Yeah. You think he's going to lose. Right. You believe he's going to win. Right. And that's something that's distinctively missing to me in modern wrestling. Brock isn't out there to do work great. He isn't out there to do a splits and holes and five stars. He's out there to beat somebody up. Right. And I'm sorry, but I, a lot of times I will take this that four minute over versus Lesnar at WrestleMania over a 52 minute match where for half of it they're going to chin lock, and then they hit three finishers on each other, and everyone starts chanting, This is off. Right. I'm like, just give me the three finishers to start with and cut out the fluff. Right. So I don't think Brock Lesnar is the greatest attraction, box office attraction of the modern era, in my opinion. Right. Like, and then going from the 2010s on, I mean, Brock Lesnar has been a world champion for the majority of the time, right? Just he's never there. Right. But you know what? Paul Kogan never wrestled on superstars either. Bruno never was on wrestling on TV either. Bruno wrestled once a month at the Garden. I wish Brock wrestled more than once. Well, I mean, that's what it is, you know? He's sure. a little bit more later on. So, it's my hand with Brock Lesnar, and you get Paul Heyman, too. That's true. You get him as part of the uh, package, and Lesnar, particularly in his more recent incarnations, I think a lot of people would have to say, and, and, and this is almost sort of a backhanded compliment, because it, it does feel like he's capable of doing more and giving more, but probably the greatest sprint wrestler of all time. And I think maybe the greatest sprint match I ever saw was him and Goldberg at Mania 33. I mean, that was five minutes, but I've never seen five minutes as compressed with action as that was. Yeah, you were never bored. You were never like, oh my God, you're into it. I mean, sure, it got like, you know, the, the crowd changing, and I've had problems with that. But it didn't draw it out for the sake of drawing it out, because for some reason, there was this thing 
said that, oh my god, I'm progressing, it has to go 30 minutes for it to be good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Especially if it doesn't fit that character. So, that was, you know, my, that was kind of my thumb press on, on it, and he's my favorite one. He's the only person, performer, pro wrestler, whatever you want to call it, that when he's on, I make sure I watch. Okay. Everybody, like, I mean, as far as matches go. Sure. Because it, to me, he is the only one left that still has that big fight feel. Yes. Because it hasn't been watered down by watching, you know, stupid crap for the sake of selling soaps, telling stories every single week. Right. Which to me, like, even before, we talked about it on the last show, even before, um, you know, all this quarantine and MC Arena matches, it was, like, nobody could even tell a story. It was just matches for the sake of matches. Right. On Raw and SmackDown. And I'm like, I, okay, why are you having this match? When Brock has matched, you know why. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And ultimately, when you're talking big fight feel uh, that no nobody can really bring today like Lesnar could, for the 80s into, at minimum, the mid-90s, I would say Ric Flair was the guy who epitomized that. He's also on your list. Absolutely. I mean, Ric Flair's self-explanatory. If he's on the list, he, uh, you know, uh, my, one of my, I remember when I was a kid, when I first got introduced to WWF up here in Albany, the kids in my house probably maybe, I don't know, we'll say kindergarten first grade, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm watching, you know, the Hulk Hogan. It was Spring Road Hogan Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3. Okay? And then I remember going to, and all the kids like, Hulk Hogan's number one. And then I remember the first time I went down to my aunt and uncle's house down in Spring, Ohio, in the NWC, in NWA. And I saw the four horsemen on TV cut the promo. And Rick Blair talking about how he used to take everyone's wives and girlfriends. And like, how he did it, be like, and I was like, how could anybody like that other guy? He just talks really loudly and bubbles on. And right. on and on. I never got, the, to this day, I mean, I like NWO Hogan, but that's about it. I never got the appeal how people chose Hogan over Slayer. They just didn't choose, other than he was loud. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand that point. I was point. like, about it, but like, I, yeah, I just, to me, it was always like, you know, like, Slayer was the kind of guy who did it. Maybe as a kid, I was always a fan of the heels. I don't know. Well, they, yeah. I was just like, this style. I could see that. I could see you being the kid that was the fan of all the heels. That that feels about right. I, I, at, at that age, uh, I was the world's biggest Ronnie Garvin fan. I was rooting for Ronnie Garvin to beat his ass. Like, he was my favorite guy back then. So, Flair being on my list gets me those Ronnie Garvin. <laughs> it was still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and... Uh, so certainly, when, when I look at this, and, and again, you, you are one of the most creative folks in the FDH lounge, hands down. You definitely have the most diversity on your list. There's more of a, a commonality, a through line on the rest of our picks. Lesnar, Flair, Raven. You wouldn't look at those three and necessarily see a whole ton in common, but what drew you to Raven as far as him being on the list? I was trying to diversify my list. Okay. I, mean, I, I, I wanted to get someone who was a big box office draw, someone who had um, and then that believability in Lesnar, somebody who also had the believability in other box on the straw, and uh, or, arguably the GOAT in Ric Flair. And then I wanted someone that could cut a promo and have that psychological aspect, and I wanted to be able to cover all facets um, in different styles and different genres. And like with the Raven, with Raven, I think, you know, as far as his feud with Dreamer and his promo work at ECW, he to some extent his WCW work, was highly underrated for its time. Um, there was a point in time I remember watching Nitro and Raven came out and he had made face pop louder than Hulk Hogan and everybody was just like, it's given Saturn delivered one of the, the funniest lines ever. I don't know why this day makes me laugh. But her being she looks over to Saturn and goes, so you guys met you killer again and Raven goes, I didn't even know we were dating. <laughs> <laughs> Right. That's how I, that's how I get to Raven. 
Well, you know, you got the great uh, feud with the Sandman, one of the classic character-based feuds of all time, where he takes Sandman's family from him. And you've got uh, as far and I looked this up today to make sure my memory was correct on this. In '99, his run, however short-lived, as NW or not NWA, WCW World Tag Team Champions with Saturn. Saturn is one of my low-key favorite wrestlers as well. So you're getting some Saturn stuff in there. Like you said, the promo with Saturn there as well, <laughs> just classic. So. Uh, as long as he tagged with him, yeah, you get it for, for these purposes. You, you might get some Kidman in there. Uh, yeah. outstanding oh yeah that's true that's true the stuff with uh with canyon and uh yeah the uh the saturn again uh, when i talk about you know some of my favorites one of my favorite tag teams of all time was the eliminators love their stuff from ecw yeah so i mean the stuff with that i mean there's there's a lot of people that that'll shit on the stuff with them and you know van damme and said oh it's just a spot fest I say you're a hater who doesn't enjoy fun wrestling. If you if you want to say that those are spot fests, so. No, no, those have some definite. Uh, speaking, speaking of the Eliminators, I just did on my WWE 2K16. I've got the my new ECW World Tag Team Champions, the odd team of Scott Norton and Stan and Larry and Anthony against the Eliminators. Wow. They won the titles in Japan. They won the titles in Japan on a Japanese show. That could be a brutal clash of styles, but I'm oddly compelled to want to see that. I need a time machine to make that match for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> Jake, you just gave me the tag team match I never knew I needed to see. <laughs> oh, the, 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 match, the match of which the, the Norton and uh, Hanson won the belt, they won it from the Miracle Pilots Connection in Japan. Wow. Well, that would be incredible as well. Oh, anytime we get a little bit of MVC in our lives, uh, you got to appreciate that. Uh, on, on the one for uh, favorite cards, uh, you have a card that's going to show up a couple of different times here. Ron Glasnap mentions WrestleMania 30, SummerSlam 92, and Bash at the Beach 96, largely on the strength of the Hogan turn at the end, albeit that was a good card, as I remember, top to bottom. I think you had a little Eddie Guerrero, Ric Flair goodness sprinkled on that one there. Uh, SummerSlam 92, obviously remembered primarily for Hart and the Bulldog uh, there, but uh, the last match of the Road Warriors in their first WWE run, I'm sorry, the LOD, I guess we're supposed to call them. So uh, it was an interesting card. It was uh, Savage and uh, Warrior 2, which is interesting because just to jump ahead here, one of Ron's three matches was Savage Warrior 1, for his three matches. So the fact that that was the co-headlining match on this show, uh, he must have really enjoyed seeing the two of them uh, together. He must have been really bummed, uh, he being somebody who I didn't know at the time, but he was at the uh, Survivor Series 92 match at the Coliseum, as I was, and I think you said previously, as you were as well, we didn't get to see them as a tag team because Warrior left not long after SummerSlam. But Mania 30, SummerSlam 92, Bash 96. Those are all fairly well celebrated cards, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's really no argument. Yeah, all three of those are kind of those are ones you expect to come off on people's lists. And I guess, in, in a way, I'm going to sort of go chalk in sort of the same way. I'm going to put WrestleMania 30 on there as a huge Daniel Bryan fanboy. Uh, I, I appreciate that one as well. WrestleMania 17, because again, a super fun card. Uh, just to jump ahead, Hart Austin 2 was actually my favorite of the Hart Austin trilogy at WrestleMania. Yeah, it had a jacked up ending. Yeah, it was the wrong ending for the wrong crowd at the wrong show on the wrong day. But everything leading up to it was just absolutely tremendous. It was those two guys at the absolute pinnacle. It, it, to me, if you want to see those two guys at the pinnacle of their powers, it would be that match. So I'm putting that one on there. And I'm sort of jumping all throughout history. I go from the 20 teens to the 2000s. I'm going to go back to 85 for this one here. I'm going to go old school. Starcade 85 on the strength of uh, Rick and Dusty culminating uh, the whole hard times storyline. 
and uh, Tully and Magnum in the I Quit match in the cage, which to me is a match that holds up better than Savage Steamboat. So those are my three cards, Jake. Make of that at what you will. Um, I, you know, two of them, I, well, the, uh, obviously I, I made a comment about WrestleMania X, and I kind of expected that to be out there. A little surprised at the love for WrestleMania 30. I mean, I guess maybe, I don't know, just kind of, you think I would love that to rock the streets, but it's just one of those, like, it was good. I get it. I get why people like it, you know? Um, I don't know, maybe because everything, like, kind of happened afterwards, kind of, but, well, uh, true. I mean, overall, as far as, as far as the whole, like, show goes, it definitely is in my, you know, top five, easily. Yeah, I was a... I like the last one, going, going old school there with uh, some uh, Star Cage 5. That, I, I figured all of yours would be way back in the day. <laughs> I, I wanted to have at least some representation there. The thing of it is is that it's more that I like scattered things from old crowds. I don't know that the cards as a whole stack up, uh, or stand up, I would say, top to bottom the way that some of the, the more modern ones are uh, for as much as I appreciate work rate, but... I will say on WrestleMania 30 that, again, you got the two great Daniel Bryan matches sandwiching the card. You have the Undertaker match where the streak gets broken. The, the, the closest thing in the modern day that we've seen to Bruno loses at the Garden to Ivan Koloff. It was very, very similar to what apparently what the mood was at MSG in 71 when that happened, something that people thought could never happen again. Uh, the crowd was shocked into silence. We were all watching it. And uh, a couple just uh, other things, too. Yes, the, the Cena-Bray Wyatt match was disappointing. Yes, there were some things on the show that weren't as great. But uh, the, the Shield had a fun little squash on the show there as well. It was the last great moment of the Shield. And uh, during that all-too-brief Shield babyface run. So it was the, the, the show was just packed with a number of moments that I really appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I can't argue with it. I had a feeling it was going to be on a couple people's lists out there, so, and I, and I can see why, I mean, it's one of those, you know, it's one of those WrestleMania ones that don't reach out to me going, well, that's three hours, or that's nine hours, I'm never getting back. Well, yeah, which is how most of the shows these days make us feel, but, uh, you look at, uh, the, the shows that you picked, and they were all, I looked at it, within a decade of each other, uh, if I was to psychoanalyze, if I was to put you on the couch, I could perhaps say, hmm, some of the formative years of Jake Digman when he was a wrestling fan, so, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the third one first, because I have said for a long time, the single greatest hour of wrestling that there's ever been was Wrestlepalooza 97, and it didn't even sum up everything that was on the show. But a lot of the most memorable points of that show showed up on the, I think it was the first hour of Wrestlepalooza uh, the next week on the ECW uh, network at the time, uh, their syndication network. And uh, again, just you will never see an hour of TV like that ever again. Just priceless. And that's kind of what I was thinking of when I chose that one, mm -hmm. because you know, I was thinking of that hour-long episode, because it never in your criteria to it had to be a paper. Right. So, but I was just looking at it. So, like, as far as sitting down for one hour of episodic wrestling television, that was the first episode of GCW that I ever got. Okay. And wow. And it never got better. It yeah. Never topped it. The whole thing of just, like, the back and forth where I actually you know, got to see an episode out in clips of stuff or whatever, but that was the first time that it was like, it came on the cat and I just happened to be home, because, kid, this is before DVR and stuff, you had to be there when it was on, um, like, and I just happened to find it at 2 o'clock in the morning, excuse me, and it, from the beginning to the end, it's just one story after, it's just one continuous story that flows right through, and it's just like a rock, you know, it's over, but it's from the beginning of, you know, the end of the Raven Dreamer feud, into the ending of it with uh, Taz winning the television championship, yep. Joey Styles and Rap Stewart Rude on commentary, uh, telling the whole story, the whole back and forth banter, the middle part with Rob Van Dam and, and Jerry the King Lawler almost inciting a riot. Perfect stuff. Perfect. It, it is Paul Heyman's magnum opus, and it is the ultimate uh, rebuttal to, uh, again, so this whole thing here, too, of like uh, the, the wrestling community, much like the TV watching community. And, and music community, and every community has its own share of hipsters. And the hipsters will always tell you about ECW. Oh, oh, the glory days were 94 to 96. That was when all the good stuff happened. 
to them, my rebuttal is, what about Wrestlepalooza 97? Because that is by far the best hour of ECW television ever. I don't even know what second place would be. Second place is nowhere visible looking down after that one. Yeah, it's just, it's absolutely incredible. And the funny thing is, the few of the week after that show, if you want to incorporate the whole event itself of Wrestlepalooza, you have the fantastic moment of Perry Satter with his leg busted up, jumping off the top rope to deliver an elbow smash yes. to uh, the Dudleys to retain the tag team title. Yes. At the time watching that, I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was truly, truly amazing. And again, you know, as a Perry Saturn mark, I, I appreciate that reference as well. So, yes, what's interesting here is, again, you're a creative fellow. Only one of your three was a pay-per-view, although uh, one was like a quasi-pay-per-view, because that either a, a Saturday Night's Main Event or a Clash was basically like a quasi. It, it just wasn't literally on pay-per-view. 